And I walk through how budgeting is freedom and spending is self-control and savings is peace and debt is a thief and generosity is joy and margin is breathing room and all of these principles um, that I believe are biblical. I mean, there was a nod to these fruits of the spirit, which I think is what we're all after. Welcome to the Hope in Real Life podcast with Jason Gore. Our team is passionate and committed to bringing you more hope in the everyday, real areas of your life. If this conversation and content is valuable for you, please do us a favor. Like, subscribe, and even share. You never know how valuable it could be to share a little bit of hope with someone else. Let's get the conversation started. Well, welcome to another edition of the Hope in Real Life podcast. No, I am not Jason Gore. I'm Wade Harris. Um, we're filling in for Jason, and obviously he has some big shoes to fill. So there's two of us, Wes Dyke is here with us as well. Wes, what's going on, brother? Hey, Wade. Appreciate the opportunity to join you. Absolutely. We have a very special guest today. We're talking about personal finances. We want to help you get your money right. And to do that, we have uh, one of the Ramsey Solutions personality. Uh, he has been on the Ramsey Show a ton. Uh, he has a new book coming out January 16th called Breaking Free from Broke. I love that. The Ultimate Guide to More Money and Less Stress. And he has about 70 million podcasts. I'll let him tell you about those podcasts. I didn't want to get those wrong. Uh, but he's great on YouTube, TikTok. His name is George Camel, and he is with us. George, welcome. It's so good to be with you guys. I feel like a wiener in a steakhouse. You guys are so cool. <laughs> you got this dope studio. I want to be in the room with you. So, uh, But it's good to be with you virtually from Nashville, Tennessee. Absolutely. George, we appreciate that. We would love to get you here, man. So uh, let's, let's talk about that when we're done with this podcast and see how we can... We can make that happen, man. Um, I want to start. Yeah, I want to start here uh, because we're talking about money management. Let's define it as you see it. Uh, obviously, Ramsey has helped so many people over the years, self included, get out of debt and really start to build wealth. Uh, but just from your perspective, how would you define money management? Well, I think money management is an interesting topic because a lot of people think they're managing their money when really they, they've they just mastered the art of managing debt. Mm. And so they, they're really just good at debt management when they tell you about their credit score and the fact that they're getting cash back on their credit cards. And so to me, money management is having a sense of control and peace with your money to where you're planning for the future, not just being able to keep up with the past, which is what most Americans find themselves doing uh, in today's day and age. So money management is going, I know exactly where my money's going. I'm hitting all of my financial goals. I'm getting ahead instead of just trying to keep up. Hey, George, some people are watching this and they're seeing, wow, that guy looks really sharp, looks great. Uh, I bet he's had it all together for his life. Uh, but that's not your story, is, is it? Stunt double. I'm hiring Wes as my stunt double right after this. That's not your story, though, oh, is yeah. it? What's your story? Well, you know, I grew up with immigrant parents. My parents are from the Middle East, and so I grew up as a first-generation American, and I saw them sort of adapt to the American culture, and that included the money culture. So very quickly, they went, well, we got to have a house, so let's get this mortgage. And, well, we don't have money to send you to college, but we'll take out the student loans and sign some Parent PLUS loans, and we'll figure it out later. And that sort of became this American dream that we were sold, but we were delivered the American nightmare mm. because I graduated with $40,000 in consumer debt between mm. my student loans and my credit card debt. And, you know, my parents did a great job raising us and they were very frugal, but the money principles, they were just average. You know, we were just middle, another middle-class family and I was just strapped with payments going, is this it? Mm. I'm cynical toward adulthood. I'm not going to hit my financial goals. I'm not making as much money as they told me I would make if I followed this primrose path of getting good grades and going to college of your dreams. And so it left me frustrated, anxious, stressed, and truly just kind of angry, mm. just a cynical, angry person. And all of that turned into getting a job at Ramsey Solutions and, and trading in cynicism for hope, realizing that I don't have to stay like this. I can get out of debt much faster than I think. These student loans don't have to die with me like many Americans have sort of just resigned themselves to. And so I followed the debt snowball, followed the Ramsey baby steps, got out of $40,000 in debt, met my wife at Ramsey. We got on this plan debt-free together. We bought a house with no credit score. We paid it off early in our 30s, and we went from broke to millionaire in under a decade following this plan. So I'm just here shouting from the rooftops, if an average George can do it, hmm. anyone can. George, I'd like for you to talk about how you bought that house with no credit score. 
I've done the same thing. So this is not me asking you from a standpoint of I don't know. But I think for a lot of people, when it comes to credit scores, when it comes to debt, they say, hey, I need a credit card to establish credit so I can buy a house, so I can buy a car. And then, of course, all that stuff with rewards and all that stuff that doesn't really matter. But just talk about that a bit of how you actually bought that house with no credit score. Absolutely. And I, I was like everyone else. I mean, you, my head would go 180 if someone said that to me 10 years ago. And so it took a big paradigm shift to realize once I got out of debt, you lose your precious credit score. Once all of your accounts are closed, about six to 12 months later, your score starts to drop and then it just disappears. It's called indeterminable. And so I thought, like everyone else, well, oh my gosh, how am I going to buy a house? And it turns out there's this old timey thing called manual underwriting. We all know <laughs> automated underwriting. Mm -hmm. The AI, the software looks up your credit score and the mortgage company goes, all right, let's give him a loan. Manual underwriting on a no score loan just means a real person looks at your financial picture and looks at your tax returns mm -hmm. and have you paid your insurance bills on time and your child care payments and your cell phone bill on time. And they grant you a mortgage based on your real financial picture instead of some magical three digit number that we've become obsessed with. And so it wasn't even that hard. It what didn't take much longer. I still got an incredible interest rate and uh, we became homeowners the right way, the Ramsey way and paid it off early. That is awesome. Um, <clears throat> George, you mentioned you met your wife uh, uh, while working at Ramsey Solutions. And I know that money uh, is a huge strain area for couples when it comes to their relationships. Uh, I believe we have a clip that we're going to run of some interviews that you did with some folks on the street, uh, asking them about their personal finances, debt, money management. Um, let's run that clip. And then I got a question or two for you. Did you combine finances with your spouse? Oh, yeah. Uh, completely? Yeah. No. We would do a joint account, but I'd have a prenup. Oh, okay. Saying, okay. hey, if they go, if something goes down, you're, that's right. You're not going to take that's me right. to the. What cleaners. I put into this marriage, I'm taking out of this marriage. Would you be more likely to date someone if they made a lot of money? Is that a factor? Yeah, probably. Yes, a lot. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Love, rich men. Money's not everything. <laughs> So I think money's kind of lower down on the totem pole. It's the intellectual connection that's more important. Oh, I like that answer. Would you marry someone with significant debt? Um, yeah. As long as you're doing something to get out of it. Depends on what the debt is for. Med school, yes. Because you're like, well, if you're a you're doctor or something. Bad, okay. But like significant credit card debt because you're... Out of control spending. Yes, no, probably not. What about a car loan? Like they have a car that's way too much of their world. Honestly, that's just stupid. So probably not. <laughs> it's good. That is good. I love. I love what she says. Well, it depends on the debt. Medical debt. Now that's a doctor. I can go with that, right? Well, my hey, my favorite guy was the British that. guy that said the intellectual because uh -huh. he, he sounded. He, I mean, he sounded intellectual too when he said that. That's yeah. good. So if you had he to had give... The, he had the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> if George, if you had to give one piece of advice to a married couple uh, about just the first step to take uh, in healthy money management and healthy relationships, good. what would that be? Well, I think it starts before marriage, ideally, because mm -hmm. a lot of couples get married and they go, we'll figure that out later. We don't need to talk about how much debt I have or how much I make or what my background is with money and how I grew up. And that causes a lot of marital tension mm. because, you know, the way I grew up might be a scarcity mentality and my parents never had money. And yours might be, well, we always had money, but we didn't talk about it. And dad always managed it. And it was kind of under the rug. And so I think communicating openly and honestly, even the, the pain, the trauma, the baggage is so important because what it does is create empathy in the marriage for me to go, oh, she's got the scarcity security gland flaring up. We need to have a bigger emergency fund. This is even more reason to get out of debt faster. Mm. So all of that helps you get on the same page and start communicating about money, which is the key. And the other key is combining bank accounts. It's become controversial to tell people to combine bank accounts because everyone is very, I want to be independent and it's my money and I worked hard to save this. But when you get married, you're either going to grow apart or you're going to grow together. Mm. And if you want to go closer and together, you've got to combine bank accounts to have shared goals and to avoid what we call financial infidelity, which is, oh, I didn't know you spent that. Oh, I didn't know you had this savings account over here. And so it becomes this, we're going to run our own separate races instead of running this race set before us together. And we found the couples who build wealth faster are the ones who combine bank accounts. They're on the same page and they're communicating openly and honestly. You know, George, one of the things, and I would probably say this is one of the core teachings that 
you hear throughout the entire Ramsey um, just kind of way of doing financial money management is budgeting, is a zero-based budget. Why is that the important place to start? And for the people who are intimidated by that, they've never done a budget. Uh, they've never sat down and looked at exactly where their money is going. How do I plan it every month? How do you encourage them to get started in a healthy way that, you know, can lead to them, you know, starting to ease some of that financial strain they may feel? Well, a lot of the times the budget has become this kind of boogeyman under the bed. Mm -hmm. It's this financial mirror that we don't want to look into. It's mm -hmm. the scale that we don't want to step on. But we, what we need to do is not see that as a scary piece, but as a just a reality check. We got to figure out where we're at so that we know where we're going to go and how long it's going to take to get there. So if you can kind of just take the shame and guilt, because that's really what it is, on top of, you know, maybe a convenience piece and laziness where it's just like, oh, I don't want to do a budget. It's just going to take forever. It's going to be a drag. I got to open an Excel spreadsheet. We've made it super easy with this app called Every Dollar. It's in the palm of your hand. And if you're married, both of you can have the app and be logged in to have total uh, visibility. But all it is, it's a reality check of what did we make this month? What do we plan on spending? How are we going to hit our goals? Mm. And can we keep the lights on and save for college and save for retirement and go on that vacation? And too many people see it as restrictive, but I see it as freedom. Because mm. once I put it on paper... I can go make that happen now. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. We could have a thousand bucks extra if we cut all these expenses and we can actually save for that vacation faster if we did this over here. So all it is is a game plan for how you're going to get to where you want to go financially. And the people that don't budget, you might still get there, but it's going to take you longer and it's going to be much more stressful because you don't truly know what the heck is happening with your hard earned income. No, that's good. Uh, let me ask you this, and this is kind of a personal thing. And I know you and your wife have been very like together, you've been on the same page. How often do you guys dream like just about what you want to do in the future with your money, whether it's vacations, whether it's giving, I know you're a generous person, whether it's, you know, whatever, but how often and like, what does that look like for you guys? Well, generally we have our kind of monthly budget meeting before the month begins where we go, all right, what's going on this month? This is very tactical. This is kind of like boring, nerdy. Hey, what's on the calendar? Hey, we have that party. Okay. We got to buy that thing, the gift for the party. We also have to <laughs> get the babysitter for that night. Right. So let's add that in the budget. We got the dog daycare. All right, we're going to do that. And so we start to lay out what's happening this month on the calendar and how that affects our finances. And then weekly, we'll check in with each other and go, hey, what's going on this week? Hey, we got to buy it. We forgot about this. Let's go back and adjust the budget. Because, you know, the, your life changes over the course of a month. So yep. don't act like you're going to have to get it perfect or else you shouldn't do a budget it's going to fluctuate a little bit. You're going to move some things around. Um, so don't be so rigid in that way. But then the other piece of it is checking in daily and going, hey, what, what happened in the bank account today? Just a quick daily check, track some transactions so that it doesn't become overwhelming. And every dollar makes this easy with the premium version because it connects to your bank account. So it's got my grocery store, the gas, all that. And I just drag it into the gas budget. I drag it into the grocery budget and it shows me exactly how much I have left to spend. So that is just a helpful mirror that we can look at daily, weekly, and monthly. It's beautiful. Yeah. Hey, George, I want to maybe transition a little bit away from an individual. And, you know, we know a lot of people listening, uh, small business owners or folks mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, are involved in uh, helping manage a business. Um, would you offer any different or how similar would your recommendations be to a business owner for how they can apply these principles uh, in their, you know, not personal world, but in their professional world? Well, we are so passionate about small business here at Ramsey. We have our own brand for business owners and entrepreneurs called Entree Leadership. And it's how Dave grew this mm -hmm. thing from a card table in his living room to the empire with a thousand team members and this campus that we have today. And he loves coaching them. And the principles, the general principles apply. Now, mm -hmm. the Ramsey baby steps don't apply because a business is run differently. But we run this business debt-free. Mm. And what we teach in Entree Leadership is the best way to run a business and grow a business is to do it at the speed of cash. And that might take longer, but it also reduces your risk and you're able to keep the lights on. You're able to avoid the layoffs because you're strapped with payments over here and the market took a shift. And so the, the principles that apply that are kind of in the Venn diagram are be completely debt-free, stay debt-free, run your business with cash. And on top of that, have savings. Have retained earnings that you're putting aside every month so that you can invest in the future and make that next hire 
and maybe buy that building one day that you you've always dreamed of. So those are the principles that always apply there. Um, on top of that, we have a lot of core values here at Ramsey, and uh, we try to you know over 30 years we've made mistakes when it comes to hiring and how we've treated people. But these core values are kind of the guiding forces and principles that sort of are paired with the financial principles. And so all of that together has allowed us to help so many business owners, especially those who have a faith background, run really successful businesses, treat their teams well, leave a legacy, pass it down to their family in the right way. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch. It's some of the most inspiring stories we hear. It's really encouraging to hear you say that. Um, I've been on staff at Hope Community Church now for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and uh, great credit to Hope's leaders and my predecessors that built an emergency fund, built a capital fund, have been accelerating debt pay down, uh, giving 10% back outside the walls of the church. So it's just great wow, to hear that's that that's awesome. very much in line with, uh, with the experts and you. Yeah, and churches should be leading the charge on this. And listen, our church that, that I go to here locally— they inherited a bunch of debt when they had a merger. And they had $7 million of, of mortgage debt on the building and the campus. And they looked up and they went, we're sending a million dollars a year to a lender between the payment and the interest. What mm. could we do with a million dollars as a church? And they started dreaming and they got the congregation in on it. And they paid off that $7 million in a year mm. with just focus intensity. Dave Ramsey came to the church. They did a huge debt-free screen. And the stuff we get to do now, the community centers we're building, um, that we have a whole ministry to provide single uh, moms with cars and car repairs. We have an adoption wraparound ministry for foster care, supporting the needs. It's amazing and inspiring what you can do when you don't have any payments in a generous congregation. Mm, it's beautiful. We are going to take a brief break from our show to let you know about a resource that we are making available to you. If you're looking for a resource on personal development or spiritual enrichment, then you've got to check this out. It's a free tool. Now, free to our listeners. Was, free is good. It was not free for us to create, but free for our listeners, made specifically for anyone who's looking for a bit more hope in their everyday life. Listen to the features, daily devotions, parenting tips, financial resources, marriage insights. There's even a community where you can share prayer requests if you've got things going on in your life and you can see and know that other people are praying for you. This is going to be available in early January. We'll make sure everybody knows. Stay tuned. Keep looking for it. We'll have it out. But listen, tomorrow can be better than today and hope is possible, even in real life. Let's get back to the show. Um, it's interesting. You have this book called Breaking Free from Broke that drops January 16th. Um, it, it, the title alone just feels like it, it just encapsulates your brand, right? Like $40,000 in debt to you and your wife being millionaires. Um, talk a little bit about like what inspired that book. I mean, one of the things when I was reading it from the intro, when Dave said, Hey, this is for a new generation. This is, um, uh, not total money makeover. The first one, financial peace mm. said financial peace for the new generation. I felt like that was like the biggest cosign that you could get for a book like that. Oh, that meant the world. And it's, it was my secret goal because I love the total money makeover. I love financial peace. And mm -hmm. I went, you know, the times have changed. Right. Yep. And so all of the younger generations are going, well, that's boomer advice. And I'm mm -hmm. going, no, this is timeless wisdom. This is God's and grandma's ways of handling money. But I do think we need to deliver it in such a time and place that it connects differently. And so what I did was I hit all of the empathy pieces here of going, mm -hmm. it is harder than it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You're right. The boomers got to buy their house in 1970 for $30,000. <laughs> and now a house is $400,000. Right. And the, you know, the wages haven't increased and inflation. And there's so many reasons why we're, we say we're not going to get ahead with money. And I rose above that, not because I'm special, but because I made a decision and I made a daily decision to buck that system entirely and just opt out of this matrix that we've created, especially in America. I mean, we are America's number one in a lot of things, and it's especially number one in debt. Seventeen trillion dollars in debt, a yeah. trillion dollars in credit card debt alone. And so I wrote this book. Two thirds of it are just helping you understand the system and how gross it is. And then the last third is how to break free from that. And I walk through how budgeting is freedom and spending is self-control and savings is peace and debt is a thief and generosity is joy and margin is breathing room and all of these principles um, that I believe are biblical. I mean, there was a nod mm -hmm. to these fruits of the spirit, which I think is what we're all after, right? We want to be led by the spirit and have peace and self-control and joy and 
all of this stuff. But what's holding us back, one of the things is money. Mm. It's become an obstacle in our mm. lives instead of a tool that helps us have kingdom impact, that helps us be stewards of what God has given to us. And so that was the heart behind the book. I've, of course, I include my story as just an example, but there's 10 million people who follow this plan. So the social proof is there. And I just lay out a choice at the end of it's up to you. You can choose cynicism and you can continue down this path and hope the next president fixes your life. Or you can choose hope. Mm. You can choose a proven plan. You can choose your hard and go, oh, fine, I'll pay off the dang debt. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get that emergency fund once and for all. I'm going to break this generational cycle yep. that my family has been in. I'm going to be the first millionaire in my family. That's the stuff that inspires us every day. Absolutely. I mean, George, I mean, you, you mentioned the emergency fund. I've even seen the debates of people online that are like, well, he wrote he wrote that 30 years ago and we don't the thousand dollars is too low now. And I'm just like, listen, he's trying to get you started. <laughs> like he's trying to get you started. But just talk about the importance of the emergency fund and and just what that has even meant in your own life and in and, and your ministry, man. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of broke people with opinions out there. Right. So I always go like, <laughs> who am I who am I listening to? And what is the context for what they're saying this and what is their motivation? And a lot of it is just people are angry, right? At the end of the day, like I go to my YouTube comments and I just see hurting people. I don't see hate. I just see hurt. That's all it is. When they go, this guy's full of it and he's telling us this and there's no hope out there today. And I'm going, man, I just wish I could hug you through the comment section <laughs> right now because there's just this hopelessness. And yeah. so what we do on the Ramsey show, yes, we have money is the vehicle, but really we're just trying to give people hope that they have a fighting chance to live differently, to leave a legacy they're proud of, to live a life they're not exhausted by. And that always includes a life with no payments and savings in the bank. So you're right, the $1,000, it wasn't enough 30 years ago when Dave started this plan. Right. But he found, he was like, well, get out of debt. That's the first thing you got to do. And then they would get hung up because they'd get the flat tire mm. or that little medical thing mm. would come up and they would get knocked back down and give up. And so he went, all right, let's have a little cushion between us and life. It's not going to cover the major things, but let's be honest, we didn't have $30,000 sitting in the bank to begin with, right? We're living paycheck to paycheck right. out here. And so that was just a little buffer to get us through getting out of debt, which, by the way, is 18 to 24 months on average. Mm -hmm. so, so that we have no payments, we have more margin, we can then save up a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months. So that's what we're aiming towards. The starter one is just to help us avoid those ankle biters. That's exactly right. In our uh, financial coaching program, we actually refer to it as debt insurance, mm. that having it there allows oh, you like to that. take care of what you need to take care of without having to reach for the plastic. Love it. Right on. That's and sweet. actually, I loved how you described what you just described as people need hope in real life, which is what this podcast is all about. Um, it sounds like an awesome Christmas present. I have another endorsement. I made my wife read the introduction, and she <laughs> said, I think I'd like to read that. So for me, needing oh to buy goodness. her a Christmas gift, uh, where can people pre-order or purchase it? Absolutely. So it's available at RamseySolutions.com slash store. And as usually, we like to bribe people with a lot of goodies. So if you can get it before January 16th, we're going to give you for free the audiobook version, which is enhanced. We've got some really cool production elements in there. The ebook for free. You get a, a video lesson that I did at our Smart Conference event, a live online Q&A event with me in January. As well as for anyone that buys the book, whether it's before or after, we're giving you three months of every dollar premium to use for free to get you started. Because we found it takes 90 days to get that budget dialed in, and we want to give everyone a fighting chance to get a hold of this money plan. So it's just 20 bucks at RamseySolutions.com slash store, and we'll give you all that stuff with it. And George, we're also giving away to our listeners a signed copy of your book as well. For anyone oh, who cool. leaves a comment on apple or spotify you will be entered into a drawing and so uh, i can just tell you this resource will help change your life particularly if you're you're really trying to get out of debt which many of you are who are tuned in today um this is something that you want to get in your hand so absolutely leave us a review we'll put you in a drawing and uh the winners will get that book that's very kind of you guys that's great do you still have time for a couple more questions Let's hit it. Awesome. I'm here. Uh, we actually asked our stewardship ministry team, uh, hey, we got George Campbell coming on. What would what would you like him to answer for you? Uh, one of the first questions they asked is, with current interest rates and with current home prices that you mentioned, is now a good time to buy a home or should I wait? Ooh, I love that question because it's one of those like, it's one of those like dad joke answers where it's like, <laughs> the right time to buy a home is when you can afford it. And so... <laughs> 
you know, it's easy. It's it's kind of like timing the stock market. It's you're probably not going to get it right. And so to go like, well, interest rates could go up, they could go down, and house prices could go up, they could go down. That's just paralysis by analysis. And so what we look at is, can you afford the mortgage payment in such a way that it's no more than a quarter of your take home pay on a 15 year fixed rate mortgage? That's when you know you you are able to buy a house. Now, for some people, that's a moving target because if it's going to be five years from now to save up the down payment, mm. we truly don't know what's going to happen. The you know the Lord could come down before then, and that we don't have to worry about a home purchase at that point. So there's so many unknowns. But what I like to do is go, what can I do to get that goal faster? And that means spend less, make more. So if it's going to take you ten years to get a house, we got to get our income up. We got to get out of debt. We got to cut some subscriptions so that we can get to that goal faster. And I know it's it can feel hopeless for the younger generations out there, or even for the person who's 40 or 50, they've never owned a home and it's a dream of theirs. Do not let rent become this thing in your head where you go, renting is a sin, I'm wasting money and everyone's telling me if I don't buy now, I'll never get to buy. That's when people will make bad decisions because it's out of desperation and impulse and hopelessness instead of out of place of peace where they've got the money in the bank and they're able to, on top of the mortgage, fund retirement and save for college and go on vacation and upgrade the car. And so that's what happens when you buy a house too early, you become house poor because that mortgage is now 50, 60% of your take home pay and you got no margin to give, no margin to spend and no margin to save. Mm. George, I don't know if you can hear our producer or my, but he is giving you a bunch of amens in the <laughs> studio right now. Yeah, thank you for that, producer. <laughs> I feel that pain. Right now. Feel that he pain. feels the pain. <laughs> I try to have empathy. I know it's easy to up here to be like, come on, just go get a house. But I know, man, it's it's a difficult thing in today's world. And you're like, I wish I'd go back to 2019 and buy a house. Yeah. You know, but this is where we are. This is where we are. So we got we got to look at reality and make decisions about what we can do tomorrow. No, that's good. Uh here's a couple more questions from our stewardship team. One is how do I get my parents to talk about their financial wishes as they age? Oh, financial yeah. wishes. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like, how do I get my mom and dad on board, which mm. is risky because they change your diaper. And so to try to tell them financial <laughs> advice, they're laughing right. you out of the room. Right. But it's a hard thing to address because as parents get older, you know, people get more set in their ways and it's harder to make a paradigm shift. It's harder to change behavior. But one thing you can do is approach it with kindness, with grace, with love, not out of a place where you're going, mom and dad, you got to do better. But out of a place of, hey, Listen, you guys raised me so well. I want to make sure that I handle this money well, that you're going to, you know, get hand down to me if there is anything. I want to make sure that you're covered. You know, do you have life insurance? Do you have long-term care in place? Mm. What's going on with your nest egg? Mm. I don't want to ask to pry. I want to ask because I love you guys, and I want to make sure that I can do my part to help set you guys up for success in the future, in retirement. And truthfully, you can have some fun with it and go like, as much as I love taking care of you, I don't want to be – taking care of you financially in your old age. And uh, that's what we've been seeing a lot on the Ramsey show is the kids calling in saying, I got to take care of my kids and my aging parents because they didn't prepare hmm. or the parents saying my kids didn't prepare. So now we're stuck. We can't retire because we're still paying off the parent plus student loans that we took out for them. These are the real life situations. And so when you get entangled in that mess, you got to go, listen, I got to put my own mask on first. Uh, before I could go try to be a savior for someone else's finances. And those are the hard conversations. They're never easy. I don't want to make it sound like this is going to be a smooth conversation. There's going to be some emotion around all of this when you start talking about money. It's a trigger for a lot of people. But you got to do it with grace and kindness and do it with a, a spirit of love where you want to help see them flourish. Mm, that is excellent. Uh, you mentioned student loans. One real quick question. As a parent... Is it better to let your kids take on student loans or encourage them to take a little time off to save some money before they go to college? Wes, that's the show closer right there, brother. That's a good question. That's Thanks to our stewardship question. team. Yeah, student loans are one of these things where, you know, parents see it as an investment and they're invested in their kids going to the school they went to. And we all want our kids to have a good job that we can brag about to our friends and where they went to school. But at the end of the day, no one cares where you went to school and what your degree is and all of that they care about are you a person of character who has the experience and skills necessary and so what i tell people if they're about to go hey we didn't save for college what do we do do we let junior just take on all the loans or do we make him figure it out or do we make him take a gap year there's all kinds of things you can do but one thing you got to do is take that off the table mm. and so once you do that you make different decisions and it becomes 
well, maybe instead of the gap year, what if I could go to the community college? Because we could cash flow that with a part time job. And in the meantime, we might be able to then transfer to a two year, you know, uh, to a to a four year school after community college and get the prereqs knocked out. And maybe we'll stay in state and commute from home so that we can make this work. And so the job of the parent is to have the conversation early and to help them develop a plan. That may not mean mom and dad cover three hundred thousand dollars of of tuition. It may just mean they're going to help you navigate the scholarships, the grants, the part time job, cover some whatever they can. But I don't believe it's the job of every parent to have to cover college for everyone. But it is their job to help their students avoid student loan debt. George, I love that. Love that answer, man. Um, student loan debt cripples so many people. Um, we like to ask this question to every single one of our guests. Um, and it's just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, what are you hopeful for in the next five years? Like when you look at your life and everything you have going on for you, I mean, you have an amazing career. You've progressed from an intern to one of Ramsey's leading personalities. You've become a millionaire. I mean, what, like the next five years, what does that look like for George Camel? Wow. Well, you you asked me at the right time because I just became a dad three months ago. Hey, wow. congrats! So that changes things. Uh, yes, I mean, you're just like all the things that used to matter. You're now like nothing matters anymore. This little girl, like <laughs> you just, you know what I mean? Like, this precious little innocent pure creature yeah. that I have to protect at all costs. And so it's definitely changed the things I'm hopeful for. But I'll tell you, just like everyone else, if you start looking at the headlines, it's easy to get cynical and go like, gosh, America's in the tank, the economy, the president, what's going to happen with the housing market? And it can feel overwhelming. But when I look into my little girl's eyes and I'm just like, there is hope. Look at this precious gift from God that was bestowed upon us that we are now a steward of to raise. And it's such an incredible opportunity to go like, she doesn't have to be a part of that. She's going to be raised with financial peace. She's never going to know debt. And it's an incredible, hopeful feeling I have that while we can't change the world, we can change our household and we can change our family tree. And that gives me great hope because even though I can't cause world peace between Israel and Palestine, I can instill a, a character and a faith into this little girl who can then have a ripple impact mm. on eternity. And to me, that's all that matters at the end of the day. My gravestone's not going to have my net worth on it, right? In that dash is just going to be, what did you do during your time on earth? How did you bless others? How did you raise your kids? How did you give? What kind of person were you? And so that gives me a different perspective on my financial goals. And it puts more emphasis on the relational goals and the spiritual goals and what kind of experiences do we want to have and what really matters. And so that's my new goal as a dad. And that's what gives me hope is this, is this little girl that we get to raise in this wild, crazy, chaotic world. It's a fun challenge. George, that's beautiful, man. Congratulations to to, to you and your bride uh, on that. And that's just so inspiring. And I mean, that really encapsulates what we are trying to do with this podcast is give you a little bit of hope in real life uh, in those everyday moments. And so uh, George's new book, you can see it behind him on the screen. It's called Breaking Free from Broke. It comes out January 16th. You definitely want to get that in your hand. Again, we're giving away free signed copies to anyone who leaves a review on Apple Podcasts on Spotify, or on YouTube, you will be entered into a drawing. And so again, George, we thank you so much for your time, man. Thank you for for just spending some with us. Oh, it's an honor. You guys are incredible hosts. Love what you guys are doing and leading Financial Peace University classes and the stewardship ministry. You are a beautiful picture of what the church should and can be. So thank you for what you guys do. Oh, thank so, you, George. That's so encouraging, man. Well, until next time. Uh, remember to have some hope in your everyday life. And we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Hope in Real Life podcast. If this content was valuable for you, don't forget, like, subscribe, share. You never know how important it could be to bring a little hope into someone else's life. Uh, there's even a place here for you to comment. We would love to hear from you and hear your feedback. Until next time, let's keep sharing hope.